Welcome to FYI, the four-year innovation podcast. This show offers an intellectual discussion on technologically enabled disruption, because investing in innovation starts with understanding it. To learn more, visit arc-invest.com. Arc Invest is a registered investment advisor focused on investing in disruptive innovation. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as a basis for investment decisions. It does not constitute either explicitly or implicitly any provision of services or products by ARC. All statements made regarding companies or securities are strictly beliefs and points of view held by ARC or podcast guests and are not endorsements or recommendations by ARC to buy, sell, or hold any security. Clients of ARC Investment Management may maintain positions in the securities discussed in this podcast. Welcome back to FYI. I'm Tasha Keeney, ARC Analyst. I'm here with my colleague, Pierce. And uh, today we're interviewing Benny, CEO of Vela 3D. Thanks for joining us. Tasha, thank you so much, Tasha Pios. Great pleasure to be here. Happy to have you here. Well, you know, to give a, a very brief background, uh, you know, Vela 3D specializes in um, support free metal 3D printing. Um, and I, I'd love to, you know, hear a little bit about uh, the origin story of Vela 3D and, and why you started the company. So um, uh, I'm a physicist by background, and uh, I spent most of my life uh, developing technologies and uh, products. I was uh, two years an investor before I started Velo. And uh, as an investor, I actually saw quite a few 3D printing companies. And what I saw is a kind of a race where everyone is trying to reduce cost. And uh, everyone is trying to reduce cost. And basically, the perception was that technology is all capable. All we need is just to reduce cost. And uh, uh, then I stumbled upon people that actually were trying to 3D print uh, rocket engines with uh, metal additive manufacturing, with 3D printing. And what I found is that all those people uh, actually uh, had really big issues and making the parts that they really wanted. They, they actually couldn't make the parts that they wanted. They had to go around that. And my um, uh, origin story, my the, the pivotal meeting was uh, with SpaceX. And I met uh, a big group of engineers. And uh, when I asked them about the limitations of the technology and how, how, how difficult it is for them, they told me that about 70% of their parts, they print no problem first time they get what they need. About 20, 25% of their parts, they uh, take maybe two, three iterations to get it right. And then maybe 5% of the parts, it takes them up to three months. They try and try and try. And after some time, they basically give up and they move on to do something else. So I wrote in my notebook at the time, uh, for this customer, resolving the limitations of the technology is a very marginal value. And as I was writing that, an engineer that was on the other side of the table didn't see my notebook, told me, you have to realize we have been 3D printing rocket engines for more than five years now. So in our sleep, we can tell you what's going to print and what's not going to print. So the reason why we have this distribution is because we know exactly what will not print and we avoid those designs. But had we have the capability to print these 5% parts, 100% of our parts would be like that. Because every one of our other parts is a compromise where we actually don't design the part that we want, but we bastardize, we compromise the design, we don't get the part, the ideal part, only to make it manufacturable. So that was a very big aha moment for me. And then I said, okay, we are going to make a technology that will allow engineers and organizations to innovate and to make the parts they really need and the products they really need without having to compromise. And that has been the driver for the company. So really allowing people to make the parts that they really need without compromising that. And um, what I found then in kind of maybe leading to the, the, uh, the question of what it is that we actually are doing. So the most uh, prevalent technology in 3D printing for metals in metal additive manufacturing is a technology that is called laser powder bed fusion. And that's a technology uh, where uh, you have basically a sandbox of powder. So it's not sandbox, it's a powder box where at the bottom of this box there is a piston or an elevator that goes down every layer 
and then this sandbox or powder box is refilled with powder and a laser is melting the areas where the part should be. And at the end of the print, you basically have the part buried in the sand or in the powder, like a dinosaur skull is buried in the, in, in, in the sand. And you lift this piston or elevator up and you expose the, the part, uh, recycle all the powder for the next build, and you have the part. This is a marvelous technology. It allows the production of very good parts, very good material, but it's very limited in its geometries. And it's limited because every time that um, you have a, a region that is less than 45 degrees uh, when you're building it, uh, that is inclined in less than 45 degrees, you have to support it. And when you have to support it, if those supports are internal to the parts and you don't have good access, to those supports, you cannot remove them, which makes the parts not really usable. When Velo came and was in, uh, started, the idea was we are going to make a technology that would solve this problem and that would eliminate the need for those supports. And can you explain that a little bit more for our listeners? What what makes uh, the part unusable with those internal supports? It, it's just too heavy or... No, no. So, so if you think about uh, why do you want to make those parts with additive manufacturing to begin with, um, there is already a very fantastic digital manufacturing technology that has been invented more than 50 years ago, and it's called CNC machining or milling. And this is basically numerically controlled a mill or cutting tool that is moving and removing material from a block of metal in a completely digitally, completely reproducibly, very predictably, very high quality parts. Where you would consider using additive as a really good business case is in parts that cannot be milled. And they cannot be milled because the cutting tools don't have access to the surfaces that you want to cut because they are internal to the parts. So when you have those surfaces that are internal to the parts where you cannot cut, where you cannot reach, if you have supports in those internal features, those supports are not removable. There's no good way to get there and remove those supports since there's no good way to get there and remove those supports. When you build the parts with those supports, they will either have to remain there or very crude remnants of those supports will have to remain there and uh, uh, rendering the part unusable because those will generally be flow channels for fluids. Those will be... Uh, energy exchange areas where you uh, apply mechanical force to convert mechanical energy or uh, pressure energy to uh, rotation energy or to uh, electrical energy or, or, or thrust. Those, those are the places that will have to be very smooth. They will have to be very precise. And now you have these ugly supports sticking there. That's the remnants of those supports, roots of those supports. That's not, let's make it very unusable. So when we started, we actually didn't know what will be the innovation. We knew what, where we want to go, but we didn't know the innovation. And one thing that we decided is that we are going to use uh, as the foundation the laser powder bed fusion technology because it's such a powerful tool. And the laser powder bed fusion also fundamentally actually already has a very big hope in that, and that is that the powder itself can support the part. So you don't need to support the part mechanically. You need to support it because as the part is getting built, you introduce tremendous forces in the part because of the thermal gradients that happen as, as the material cools down from its melting point to the temperature of the rest of the part. And those forces causes the part to curl, causes the part to warp. And those warps, uh, those this warpage is what's... Um, basically uh, uh, the support is required to mitigate because those supports are actually not supports, they are anchors. So they are anchoring the surfaces to the bottom, preventing them from warping. And that's kind of another thing to understand. They have to be very strong. So they're not just, just, just to kind of slightly support it. They're really, really strong. So when we started to research that, uh, the first thing that we basically identified is Depending on the geometry, you can actually uh, apply a set of steps as you are making the part that as the 
part is being produced, the stress that is introduced in every layer can be compensated and can be in very in in a large way erased by the next layers as you are doing this. So, but uh, by using software that predicts and that identifies the areas where you're going to have warp, you can actually prescribe locally manufacturing steps that will cancel those uh, stress accumulations, that each layer will cancel the stresses that uh, happened uh, beneath that. So that uh, contains the formations and the warps that, that is happening. So it doesn't eliminate it, but it dramatically reduces that. So at the heart of what we do is this very sophisticated software that is taking the part and is analyzes it. And the, soft, the result of that is that the software prescribes for every point a set of uh, steps that are uh, designed to get to the right outcome, even though you are not applying supports, even though in a natural process, if you want, the part would, should have warped a lot, but the local recipe, the local manufacturing instructions that are determined by the local geometry are negating this effect. So the, at the heart of this, it's this combination of uh, software that is implementing a very deep physical insight and basically a very deep manufacturing processes that we developed and that the software intelligently applies locally on the part as it produces it, as it creates the manufacturing instructions for that. The second part of that that is very important is even though you are doing this, the parts are going to produce, to protrude some. They're not going to protrude as much. Yeah, it's not perfect. So you have to provide a tolerance. You have to provide a margin that protrusions like that would happen, and yet the part is not going to be destroyed in the build. And the reason why protrusions are so detrimental to the to the parts and can result in the build destruction is because the layers that you're building are very thin. They are typically 50 microns layers, 50 micrometer layers. So as you're stepping down layer by layer and you're refilling it, the mechanical recoder is hovering few tens of micron above the part. So few tens of micron of protrusion and you have a mechanical contact between the part and the recoder that refills the powder. And now you are applying forces on that. You can move the part. You can distort the part. You can actually uh, distort the recoder. And uh, if you are distorting the recoder, you are propagating the damage to areas nearby that had no issues before that. So uh, what we uh, invented is what we call a protrusion tolerant recoder. It's also, we sometimes refer to that as a non-contact recoder, which is at its heart, it's a, a mechanism that basically uh, hovering about, above the powder bed, about a millimeter above the powder bed. So it deposits a very uniform layer of powder while never getting closer than a millimeter from the part and the powder bed, giving us about a thousand micron tolerance of where parts can protrude and damage will not happen. And the way this is done, it's, it's actually the powder is distributed evenly through the forces of gas flow. So we basically distribute that and uh, using a mechanism uh, that emulates, if you think about this, the very smooth and very uniform surface that you get uh, when you have a sandstorm leaving the desert or a, a, a long night uh, of snow and wind in the Midwest, leaving a very, very planar field of snow that is planarized by the forces of air, not by a mechanical kind of device that is uh, planarizing it. Something that a lot of 3D printing manufacturers are still continuously improving is the, the repeatability of the part. So your machine is kind of you know, learning how to make small tweaks to the printing process while it's happening. How important is it for every part to come out exactly the same way? And, um, you know, how, how do you think of that issue um, for, for, you know, for, you, for your applications? Yeah, so I didn't touch upon the third part of our technology, which we actually brought from the world of semiconductor. If you think about what we described until now, 
uh, 3D printing is actually quite similar to uh, semiconductor in the sense that it's a digital process and you have many, many layers, thousands of layers in uh, 3D printing, hundreds of layers in semiconductor, and you have uh, billions of points on a layer that you have to basically decide what you do there. You have trillions of points in a, in a, in a wafer, or maybe you know thousands of trillions of points in a wafer uh, in a layer that you have to, to, to get right. So the key in making that successful is ensuring that in every layer, your process is in control and is producing the same results. So one of the things that we developed is a set of metrologies and a set of tests that allows us to validate that the system produced produces standard outputs when standard inputs are applied to that. So we basically characterize all the things that you have to check that you can you you basically say if I apply those inputs and I get those outputs, then if I take a standard file, a golden file, and I put that in any one of our machines in any time, I'm going to get the same output. This allows something that is very, very critical. It allows you to ensure that every part that you get is compliant as an identical to the intent. But it also allows you to create a scalable supply chain. That's something that has never been seen in additive manufacturing, where now you can have three or four contract manufacturers using the same machine, where the OEM can have a golden production file and then can send this golden production file to any of those four contract manufacturers, knowing that they are going to get exactly the same parts with exactly the same material properties. And that's extremely critical to this mission critical applications we are talking about, because whether you are in aerospace or in oil and gas or in power generation or in semiconductor, the cost of failure in all of those cases is extremely high. So um, what one of the things that is characterizes our applications is that the engineering margin for those designs is very small, and they are really designing to the limits of the materials. They, they really care about the material quality. It's not just aluminum or it's not just titanium. They really care about how close this titanium to the theoretical performance of titanium that I expect to get. So it's not just about making the part the same geometry. It's about making the material that this part is made of uh, with the same material properties, because those material properties are actually very difficult to assess just looking at the part. So you really need to have very high confidence that the material properties are the same. And that's one fundamental difference between this technology and machining, because with machining, you start from a billet, and then you machine the part out of the billet, but you don't change the material that is in the billet. So if you have a good material coming from the material supplier, you're going to get always the same material quality. Whereas in additive manufacturing, you don't know. There are so many things that can go wrong. So validating that the material quality in every point of the part is the same, is a, consistent, and is good, is a really critical part of, of this. That also seems like a potential advantage in the sense that you can control in many ways, the some of the structural and physical properties of the material as you're as you're uh, adding layers. You know, like we hear a lot about in aerospace applications, different parts needing to have a certain you know, strength or tolerance. And there's like a common practice in many like engineering firms that you know you will build a part you know X percent above a, a sp specific strength requirement. You know, and or, or if it breaks, it needs to break specifically at these areas. You know, how do you think uh, additive manufacturing and specifically your technology kind of fits fits into those kind of things? Yeah. So one of the things that is most critical to our customers is the ability to provide with every build what we call a build report that uh, provides a very high level of confidence that the part is identical in its material properties to the standard, to the expected uh, outcome of this, uh, of, of this, of the material. So uh, the designers 
uh, are required, you know, in many cases by regulation, to have a specific engineering margin of strength above the material design, uh, above the material properties. So that's kind of part of it's called design allowables, right? It's part of how the how 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 the design practices go. But in order for them to be able to do that, they need very high consistency in the material properties. So this is this cannot be part specific. When they design, they need to know that every part is going to comply with that. So providing the providing the build report with information that allows them to know that there is nothing that happened in the build that would result in an excursion. And it allows them to look at all the critical aspects and validate that everything was in control. It's really critical to know that this is a good part and is very critical to being able to create this uh, scalable supply chain. Because if when you can get that not just from one machine, but from any supplier that provides you these parts, you, you send them the, the golden file, you get the parts, and you get the certificate of compliance uh, of this part uh, to, the, to the intent. So that's extremely critical uh, to what these uh, customers uh, are trying to, to accomplish. That kind of brings us into like a, like we, I saw on your Twitter uh, a while back, you mentioned that metal 3D manufacturing, additive manufacturing is highly commoditized and that you didn't start Velo 3D to get into the commodities business. Did, did you, what did you mean by that? Were you saying that you wanted to push the boundary of the capabilities here or? Yeah, so, so there is a concept in uh, additive manufacturing uh, that is called the design for additive manufacturing. And this is a pretty perverse concept because basically what it what it suggests, what a lot of people talk about is now with additive manufacturing, you can do geometries you couldn't do before. So look at all the beautiful things you can do. But about 80% of design for additive manufacturing is not that. It is about how to understand the limits of the technology so that you avoid all the things that you couldn't produce. And basically what we say is, we want to make design for additive manufacturing smaller and smaller. We want to allow the engineers start from, you have to design, you can design to what you really want. And then at the margin of that, there are limitations. There is always physics that you have to take into account. But this physics should, we want to make, to get it to a point that this physics is at the margin of that. So you can design what you want, not what the manufacturing process limits you. So when I talk about commodity, what I mean is that if you look at the manufacturing uh, at, at the laser powder bed fusion today, which is probably about 80% of metal additive manufacturing, maybe 75%. But when you look at this technology, there is more than 10 big suppliers in the West uh, and maybe another 10 suppliers in China and maybe another 50 small suppliers that all Pro, pro, provide systems with very, very similar capabilities, with very similar control capabilities on the material quality, with very similar geometrical limitations. So when you have an end with very similar cost structure, so when you have all these people creating basically identical solution, that's the definition of commodity. And all those companies are fighting for this bloody patch of water where everyone is fighting with each other on the designs that can be compromised using design for additive manufacturing. And when we started to work on that, we noticed that there are a lot of customers that have designs that those compromises are extremely painful for them are, and to the point that they are not usable or hardly usable for their applications. So we decided that instead of focusing on this very bloody patch of Red Bay, where everyone is fighting uh, for the same business, we decided that we are going to exclusively focus on the blue ocean outside of that. And initially, when we started, people looked at us and said, oh, okay, so you are the niche player focusing on all the applications that you cannot do with the com conventional additive manufacturing. And that's kind of a picture that is very Earth-centric. When you look at the universe, you say, okay, the Earth is the center, and you know the space around that is the niche that is outside of space, of, of, the, of the Earth. But when you look at that a little broader, you say, oh, actually, it's the opposite. 
the universe of the applications that cannot be addressed with the existing technology is so much bigger than the little bubble that you can. We decided to focus on that. It takes a little bit more, more effort in terms of business development and market education and customer education and, and marketing. But the payoff of that is price stability. We don't have a list. We don't have an average sale price. We have a list price. We always sell the same price. There's no negotiation on the price. Either you need us or you don't need us. If you need us, 10% discount is not going to change it. The other advantage is that we are expanding a market that we are the only ones that can serve. And by educating the customers and bringing the customers into this uh, opportunity, we are creating a lot of loyalty and a lot of collaboration with the customers where customers want to work with us more and more. So it creates a very deep sense of partnerships with our customers. So it's not only about the technology differentiation, it's also about creating this interface and this uh, relationship with the customers where you, you, customers uh, appreciate that you spent all that time at the beginning to educate them and to bring them into the technology and they want to keep working with you into the future. So the value of spending the time on this opportunity that no one is covering is that we are discovering America. We sailed into this blue ocean and by doing this, we discovered a new world and it's our world for us to, 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 to help our customers and to take, uh, to grow with them as they, as we do that. And can we actually take one step back? You know, you, you touched on it already that, um, 3d printing allows you to, uh, more design freedom. Can you explain why that's important in the applications that your parts get built into? Yeah. So, you know, if you think about flow problems, right, and the fluid containment and fluid motion control, in general, you what you see is that you need very smooth and very uh, kind of natural designs. So um, if you think about this, a sphere is a very optimal a solution to many things in terms of you know optimizing volume to to surface area in terms of optimizing stress if you need to flow fluids through something a cylinder is an ideal cross section because a cylinder again has the minimum surface area per cross section it also has uh, the it, it avoids corners it avoids uh, stress concentrations etc why am I saying well, this is this is obvious, right? But when you look at design for additive manufacturing, and you'll see it's some uh, basic things that I just described, what you'll see is people recommending building them like Gothic cathedrals. Meaning you'll basically, instead of a round pipe, what you'll see is a diamond-shaped pipe. There is a reason why you'll not find diamond-shaped pipes in nature or any, uh, you know, a uh, thing that uh, 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 any mechanical design because it's a very unnatural it's a very suboptimal way to do that in a similar way there is when you want to contain something you want a dome you want a sphere you don't want something that ends with a spike with a with a with a cone at the top to prevent this less than 45 degree surfaces so the design limitations of this design for additive manufacturing is extremely unnatural for the main application field where metal 3D printing is actually usable. So the main application field is this management of fluids, this management of uh, energy transfer. Uh, and in those, in those applications, it's all about uh, reducing pressure, reducing uh, losses, and efficient energy transfer between a fluid and a mechanical object uh, or uh, and uh, this geometrical uh, features with sharp corners with non-round surfaces are extremely uh, compromising to the physical performance of, of, of this uh, solution. So, And that's true whether you're doing turbo machinery, whether you're doing rocket engines, whether you're doing compressors, whether you're doing uh, heat exchangers, whether you're, whether you're doing jet engines. In all those applications, it's, 
it's kind of, like Richard Feynman said in, in one of his books, the same differential equations have the same solutions. So uh, they all want the same solutions, and these solutions are not the solutions that additive manufacturing, the commodity additive manufacturing wants to print. And what we say is like, forget about that. You design what you need. Our job is allowing you to make those parts, to make them without having to compromise, neither on the part design nor on the part quality. Right. So, you know, we always talk about it, Arc, how 3D printing allows you to make a part that's basically better designed, better manufactured for, for what it's actually supposed to do. So your technology is like one more iteration on that for, you know, better than what 3D printing previously could do. It's even it's even more optimized for what the part performance is actually meant to be. And then, you know, if I if we maybe we could talk a little bit about the industry in general. You know, I feel like I always get asked this question you know, oh, like 3D printing, is that is that still happening? Um, and I, I think that, you know, so maybe some some investors or observers will look at kind of the industry over time. And, and actually, this is one area where ARC even expected, um, you know, the revenue growth to happen a bit faster than it ended up happening over the, let's say, like the past five to seven years. I think that, you know, it could be a combination of factors, regulation, education on the technology. Um, you know, what... What would what would you say to that, and and, and what's really driving the the growth of this industry going forward? So I think we we didn't touch upon one important thing that has been associated with the limitations that I described, and that's people. A lot of what has been discussed in the industry is the need to educate a new workforce with these new capabilities, and. You know, and I talked about the limitations of the technology. And if you think about the audacity of this statement coming from the industry, you have a technology with very little capability that in order to be adopted is expected the world to change so that it will be adopted, right? It's so like you need to educate all those PhDs and material scientists that will be doing process development and parameter optimization so that you can manufacture. You need to re-educate all those design engineers so that you will be able to start thinking to the limitations of the technology so that you can design with those limitations in mind. And that's before you prove that you actually can do something valuable. So, you know, when you look at a lot of the conferences of additive manufacturing, you know, they they, they spend a lot of ink on this topic of we need to re-educate, we need to develop a new generation of people that know uh, how to think 3D printing. I think that there is a lot of you know, this self reverberation in the industry where the industry did not have this retrospective on are we actually providing the capabilities to make this useful? <clears throat> so I think one of the things that is changing is at the heart of that, the reason why the technology didn't explode in its utilization is because it was very limited. It's not just about cost. It was because actually metal additive manufacturing, and I specifically talk about 3D printing in metal. I, I, that's, that's the universe I, I'm aware of. It has been very limited in capabilities, and this has changed now. And now that this has changed and people can actually design the parts that they need to design, they don't have to go through this very painful set of compromises that is very, extremely anticlimactic. You design, you have these dreams, like, okay, I'm going to do all these great things, and then you try to put that into additive manufacturing, the 3D printing stuff. No, you cannot actually do that. And by the time you compromise that, what you got is something that is not that great, actually. So this is changing now. You actually can now make the designs that you really wanted, the designs that have been optimized by uh, computer software. Uh, very often, computer software that involves machine learning that allows people to make very, very sophisticated designs, very optimal designs that would not be able to uh, to be designed by human simply because the amount of is is simply because the amount of uh, trials that go through of configuration is so massive. No human team would be able to go there, and and the solutions are extremely complex, and extremely non-intuitive. So software now can create for you designs that you couldn't think about before. And those designs are now manufacturable for the first time. Outside of um, the you know, software optimization solutions, like 
it seems to me like the fates of material science and additive manufacturing, especially with metal, are fairly linked. Like, do you see any key innovation drivers or like limitations in terms of you know material science and what you know feedstock materials can be used and and where that's going and how that limits things so far? So there are three components here, right? So there is the design software. And we are seeing now marvelous breakthroughs in design software. Uh, and uh, we have been collaborating with some companies um, that uh, basically enabled this uh, workflow of machine learning and uh, computer uh, uh, flow that comp- uh, computational flow dynamics to create very, very sophisticated designs, designs that would have not been possible even three years ago. The manufacturing technology capability that we are bringing to the market. And uh, when we talk about material science, I think this will be the next frontier. So uh, material science and new, and new metal. So um, until now, our focus has been to bring to market very well-known alloys with very known properties that the world knows exactly what to expect on all levels. And what we need to demonstrate on those is equivalency to the properties when the, compared to the alloys made conventionally in, in, in conventional methods. And that's relatively easy because the world knows what to expect from them. So as long as you prove that you have the same material, it's a relatively easy qualification. The next phase is the innovation of new alloys. So there are alloys that are not 3D printable, that are very valuable for engineering purposes. And... Uh, I think that the next phase would be to replace those alloys with 3D printable alloys with similar properties or even better properties. And that's a very innovative process with material science and with metallurgy. But 3D printing provides some unique opportunities that you didn't have before because of the very, very fast solidification that happens when you produce using 3D printing. And this fast solidification allows you to produce metals that are not thermodynamically stable. Because in a traditional process, you create metals that are thermodynamically stable because you slow, you cool down very slowly. So uh, the alloys that are created are alloys created uh, in this slow precipitation, slow solidification. But when you solidify, when you crystallize in tens of microseconds, you don't have the time for thermodynamics to come into play. So things are freezing kinetically before they have the time to arrange to their thermodynamic equilibrium, which means that now you have the opportunity to create metals that are not thermodynamically stable. And that opens the uh, vast uh, universe of metals, alloys that were not uh, available before. And uh, this is a very interesting area. We are not at the frontier of this area of velo 3 d uh, there, are, there are institutions and there are uh, researchers that are studying this, but there are some very exciting discoveries, and we are partnering with some of those organizations on some of these newly discovered alloys uh, to uh, to basically bring to market very high performance alloys that previously were at the edge of what you could do with conventional methods, but you couldn't have similar alloy by additive manufacturing, now those alloys become available. And and I think this is going to be a very exciting next phase in additive manufacturing. Got it. So 3D 3D printing not only gives you this this freedom of design, um, you know, you particularly give like a, a, yeah, another turn on that that freedom. And then you're you're saying that from a materials perspective, you're also able to use materials that you would never be able to use with traditional methods or perhaps even other 3D printing methods um, that give you these great part properties that you know really really weren't previously achievable is that the right way to phrase it yes with one caveat that i would like to take to say and the caveat is that at this moment our manufacturing technology velo 3d manufacturing technology i am not aware that we are providing specific unique capability in terms of new materials so i don't want to claim something that is not necessarily belonging to us right so so the material part uh, as far as I know, the materials that are producible on our system, in principle, could be producible by on other laser powder bed fusion systems. On other 3D printing systems? 
Understood. You know, I'd love to, I'd love to talk a little bit more um, about the the software side of things. And, you know, you already mentioned this, and you and I have talked about the idea of generative design in the past. Um, basically, a, a computer gives you a part design that maybe a human wouldn't have thought of. That's actually, again, more perfectly optimized to what the part is supposed to do um, in its life cycle. But, you know, generative design is, from what I understand, it's still in the you know, early days um, in 3D printing, um, there's there's still some work to be done. Can you can you kind of like give us a a view of the the state of play of how machine learning and perhaps like advanced optimization is making its way into 3D printing? Like, what is the promise? You know, where are we today? And sort of what is your hope for the future and and how that works and maybe like the design and production and uh, part validation process? It's actually extremely interesting. So both kind of uh, business-wise and uh, at, at the physics level. So, you know, the concept of generative design, topological optimization, right, has been out there for a long time. And it's not been super valuable. And the reason why it has not been super valuable for a long time is because the things that you could do with that would be structural elements, that you could optimize the structural elements using structural analysis, and then you basically, the way you do that, you try different geometries, you analyze them, and then you do genetic algorithms that uh, modify the, the design. You run them through the simulation, and you gradually converge to an optimal solution. That was kind of the limit of that. And the reason why this was not very valuable is simply because those structural parts are not super valuable application of additive manufacturing. All they offer is weight reduction, just like some something nice, but in many ways you actually don't even need additive manufacturing to to actually accomplish that. Uh, our chairman Carl Bass, that is also an uh, amateur machinist, has, has a marvelous machine shop uh, in his garage, has machined a beautifully designed additively manufactured uh, a, a table that was designed for additive manufacturing, except he designed it, it machined it from scratch on a five axis mill. Uh, so a uh, beautiful, beautiful part. So you don't really need additive manufacturing to make that. It's not super high value application of that. Where additive manufacturing becomes very valuable is again for fluid flow solutions. The problem there is that uh, unlike structural analysis, fluid simulations employ computational flow dynamics, Navier stock solution, very nonlinear equations. These simulations now don't take minutes they can take days per per event. They could take 12 hours, they could 24 hours, they can take 36 hours. So one breakthrough that we have stumbled upon is a, an amazing company that in the last few years have developed a mathematical transformation from the geometrical world to a neural network. It's a mapping that allows them to take uh, configuration, simulate that with computer computational flow dynamics, and with very small number of simulations, teach a neural network about the physics of the computational flow dynamics in this scenario, so that now you could use the neural network as a machine learning tool to actually try different uh, solutions. So you use genetic algorithms to try different solutions where the solver is a neural network that now solves it in less than 100 milliseconds instead of a few days. So now you actually brought computational flow dynamics problems to a topological optimization, to generative design. And that's a very exciting and a very uh, interesting capability. And the thing that is exciting about that is how they figured how to teach a neural network about a computational flow dynamics problem with less than 100 uh, examples. And what allows them to do that is this marvelous ma mathematical transformation that allows them to extract tens of thousands of labeled data, if you want, from every simulation. So every simulation is not just one learning point. It's tens of thousands of those learning points that they can then feed into the neural network. The neural network can use that to actually get a grasp of the physical problem. 
And just to give you an idea, we humans solve every day very complex computational flow dynamics problems without realizing we are doing that with the neural network in our brain, right? Every time that I throw a ball at you and you catch it, right, the curved ball and you catch it, you're solving a computational flow dynamics problem. You just don't know that you're doing this, right? So we are really good at doing these things, learning through example, training neural networks through example. What they are doing that is amazing in my opinion is they are able to do that with very few data learning sets enabling us to teach the neural network, not in 10 years, but in a few days. So when you say they're using a, a genetic algorithm, like you're saying that like the, the machine learning or the, the, the model has learned the best way or the most probable way to modify the topology such that the next simulation is better. And then you iterate on that again and again. Uh, the primary use of the machine learning is to emulate the computational flow dynamics uh, simulator. So when you have a specific configuration, instead of running that for 24 hours in a computational flow dynamic cluster, you run it through a, uh, uh, through a neural network that spits to you the result in less than 100 milliseconds. So now you can put these geometries into a genetic algorithm modifier that just runs different you know, a gradient descent, if you want. So for our listeners, by probably important to note that like normally CFD simulations take a long time, even on a supercomputer. So, so the, the benefit here is speed, right? Is that, is that inaccurate? Exactly. It's, it's two things, right? It's, it's speed. It's basically using neural water net, network to accelerate something by about 100,000 times. But then the ability to teach this neural network within days as opposed to within years, right? These are the two big innovations, right? To create a reliable neural networks within days that can replace uh, something that, uh, that can accelerate the simulation 100,000 times once it's trained. Wow, fascinating. <laughs> well, you know. <laughs> <laughs> we, went, we went really geeky here. <laughs> Oh, that, that's what we love. That's, we, we love getting into the details. So we, we appreciate you explaining it. Maybe we can end on um, what, is, what is your hope for, um, you know, what the future holds for Velo 3D's 3D printing technology? Like, how will this change? How will this change our everyday lives? Like, what, what, do, you, what do you think is, um, you know, the, the unlock that we might get in, in the future that we're probably just, you know, getting started on today? Yeah. So to me, you know, where Velo3D is applied well is, you know, for the general problem of energy, anything that has to do with energy, right? So, so whether it's, you know, space travel, whether it's aviation, whether it's electric car cars, whether it's power and how we uh, generate power and how we store power, if you think about this, and and by the way, and 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 I didn't get into the uh, world of material processing, whether it's semiconductor or other material processes, and in all those places, you can do tremendously more innovative, tremendously more compact and more efficient solutions with three D printing than you could do before. Now you have the ability to make designs that are much much more optimized. So my vision is that five, seven, ten years from now. When you're going to step into an airplane, when you're going to step into your Mars travel ticket, or when you're going to uh, talk over whatever will replace your phone in, in 10 years, all those things will be will have Velo3D inside behind them. So all those things will be not only manufactured, many of those things will be manufactured on Velo3D machines, but their design concept will revolve around using these machines to enable this innovation. So, and we are seeing that today in one of the most ambitious programs that you know, can, uh, mankind uh, try, uh, tried. If you look at the Starship and you look at the Raptor engines, there is at the heart of the Raptor engines are components and design concepts designed around our capabilities. So. This tremendously innovative company 
uh, SpaceX that has identified this opportunity earlier than anyone else and pushed that faster and deeper than anyone else. We are going to see many other people that take their product and innovate it and design it around this capability. And I think we are going to be living in a better world. One of the things that I hope, we didn't get there yet, but one of the things I hope is that through this, uh, this elusive concept of nuclear fusion will be enabled because it's a material and it's a geometry and it's an engineering problem. And it's one of the hardest problems of energy convergence the uni mankind had in historically faced. And energy conversion problems need additive manufacturing to operate perfectly. So I hope that we are all going to be using fusion electricity in 10, 15 years powered by Velo 3D. I love that. You know, 3D printing is kind of, it's it's driving the future of invention. It's making what was previously impossible, possible. So, you know, we often talk like, we talked a lot about the details about the, you know, the exact design and manufacturing process and sort of on the part level, what you can change. Um, but you're saying that, you know, this, this could kind of also give birth to like even new industries, new, new, um, you know, platform technologies that weren't really possible before. I, I absolutely believe that, yes. Great. Well, <laughs> I'm excited for that. Um, thanks so much for coming on our podcast, Benny. Uh, this was very informative and uh, much appreciated. Thank you so much. Thank you, Pierce. Bye-bye. ARC believes that the information presented is accurate and was obtained from sources that ARC believes to be reliable. However, ARC does not guarantee the accuracy or completeness of any information, and such information may be subject to change without notice from ARC. Historical results are not indications of future results. Certain of the statements contained in this podcast may be statements of future expectations and other forward-looking statements that are based on ARC's current views and assumptions, and involve known and unknown risks and uncertainties that could cause actual results, performance, or events to differ materially from those expressed or implied in such statements.